Welcome to Amazing Applications, the podcast for Microsoft business applications creators who want to build amazing applications that everyone will love. Hi, I'm your host, Neil Benson. My goal on this show is to help you slash your project budgets, reduce your delivery timelines, mitigate technical risks, and create amazing, agile Microsoft Dynamics 365 and Power Platform applications. What tools are available to help us document complex applications? That's the question I posed to Daryl Labar and Jonas Rapp, co-hosts of the XRM Toolcast recently. It was just as I was embarking on a consulting engagement to help a client devise a roadmap for migrating a Dynamics CRM 2013 and a CRM 2016 environment into a single Dynamics 365 online environment. On the XRM Toolcast podcast, Daryl and Jonas cover a range of tools that Microsoft Business Apps teams can use in their projects, and they often have expert guests on their show diving deep into those tools' capabilities. I thought they'd be the perfect people to ask about tools for documenting complex systems, and they didn't let me down. You'll find show notes, a transcription, links to all the tools we covered, and contact details for Jarrell and Jonas at customary.com slash 023. Customary is the word customer with a Y on the end, dot com slash 023. Here's my conversation with Daryl and Jonas. Hi, Jonas. Hi, Daryl. How are you doing? Hi there. How are you doing, Neil? It's great. Good. Um, thanks, guys, for hopping on a call with me. I've got this real predicament, and I was really hoping you could help me out. I've been mm-hmm. asked to do a technical assessment for a client. They've got a couple of different Dynamics CRM 365 instances. One is 365 8.2, so you know the earliest, just after CRM 2016. Mm-hmm. The other one is CRM 2013. Ooh. Um, they're both on premise, and I've been given the task of doing a technical assessment of those two systems. That's part A of the engagement. Part B is to do a roadmap for how they would migrate to Serum mm-hmm. Dynamics 365 online. So I've got my work cut out for me. These are on premise systems. So I'm connecting over Citrix to a remote desktop um, where I'm logging onto these systems and I've got to do a technical assessment. My normal go to tool for this kind of work is Snapshot for Dynamics 365 from XRM mm-hmm. Coaches, which has been amazing for similar scenarios. But in this instance, I can't install it locally. And I've managed to get XRM Toolbox running on that remote desktop. And I would love your advice on what tools I should use to document a client system to perform a technical assessment. So great to have two experts on the line with me. What yeah, what a, what a coincidence. So you, you <laughs> teased us with a, being on a podcast and getting you as a guest also. By, so you basically want us to solve your problem. Uh, that would be awesome, yes. And yeah. I will pay you in beer tokens if there's ever an MVP summit. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we'll take it next, next decade. Yep. Next decade. So uh, it's kind of interesting when you say technical assessment, because when I do a technical, technical, like there's so many levels of what's a technical assessment, right? I mean, sure. you can go all into the code and say, all right, do you, do you log stuff in your plugins? Is there plugins like make sense? Are they using five different, you know, plugin classes? Do they have issues with uh, multi-threading and race conditions that you're hitting every now and then and you just don't notice because you're not hitting it enough? Like, so there's like that really deep level. I'm assuming that you don't care about. Um, I'm assuming you want like the level above that. Yeah, these systems are pretty old, right? They're yeah. what, three, five, six years old, seven uh-huh. years old in the case of CRM mm-hmm. 2013. We're not going to pick up those plugins and migrate them to 365. So, okay. you know, um, knowing what the plugins do is probably the level of detail we uh, need to get okay. to. How they do it, how they implement it, how well written they are. Um, yeah, cold cool quality is, is too low. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, the first thing that I usually do when I walk into a, a scenario like that would go and see how many plugins do they have? How many places are they registered? What sort of registration steps do they have? So that's, that's a tool that's already written in the external toolbox. So you'd have access to that and it'd be the plugin registration tool. There's an export feature on there. You can export that all out and put that all right. into an Excel sheet and go through and figure out, Oh, they've got X number of plugins and X number of plugin classes. And, you know, you know, figuring out there's that, that amount of work. Um, so that, that's at least, you know, to get started, at least on the server side, 
uh, you could do something similar on the client side and, and use the web resource manager to suck all the web resources out and see how many files they have, how many things are they doing, um, and, and just take get a JavaScript scope. JavaScript as well? Yeah, that takes all the JavaScript out um, and that kind of stuff. Now, you, if they're doing any minifiers where they're taking the JavaScript and they're making it ultra tiny, so it's ultra efficient for the machine, but you can't like read it at all as a human, uh, and they don't have like a source control to give you to give you the actual like source. Uh, yeah, that's that's really bad. <laughs> Good luck with is, that um, one. Is minim minification? Is that how you say minim minimification? Minification. Yes. Is yes. that a popular technique for Microsoft partners to to do on their JavaScript for a client? It seems pretty mean. It's popular to do for the ISVs, right? Yeah. But the actual clients themselves, I generally don't recommend it ever because I don't see them getting the performance gain out of the debugging horror. Exactly. I mean, the the benefit of that would be, I think, it's two sides to it. I mean, as an ISV, you you obfuscate the code. It's not it's not uh, encrypted or just binary, but it's really hard to read, and also it re reduces the size of them. And I mean, in some scenarios, you can also do that uh, as where you're bundling several files into one. So so you develop them. And when you do that, you have a nice and tidy structure, perhaps with folders and so on. But then you only want one file to be loaded in the, in the, in the clients. So then you can sort of bundle them and uh, it will hopefully be cached and so on. So, so it could be a performance gain. But as Daryl says, I think it's mostly ISVs that do that nowadays. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. That's right. two two great tools. So the plugin registration tool, to analyze the plugins, catalog those, figure out what they're doing, or at least yeah. where they're being triggered, I guess. And then yeah. the web resource tool to show me mm -hmm. some of the web resources, in particular the JavaScript files. Yeah. I think uh, I would, I mean, to start, you didn't really mention how much you know about these systems when you get into this project. But I, I would say uh, uh, perhaps unexpected <laughs> tip from me is to start with the tool called communication just talking to the client i mean what does this system do at all what are we looking for i mean you can go ahead look for plugins and but but unless you know why they're there you you really cannot assess whether it's this is just obsolete code no one ever creates that entity anyway it was something someone thought of in well ages ago so i mean <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the unnerdy yeah. answer, but just making sure that you know what what why they have a system at all. Communic communication is that actually work? I I, I don't I just, that always seems to break down for me. I I heard about it anyway, so I read it somewhere. <laughs> Let me just fire up the XM toolbox and see if there's a tool for that. No, nope, no. <laughs> We have had the benefit of a demonstration from somebody in the IT department who gave us a quick overview of the two systems and then uh, a kind of a system manager from each of the business areas to give mm -hmm. us a more deeper dive into the functionality that they use. And that, that part was critical because, like you said, there's there could be lots of old customizations that happen in parts of the system that nobody uses anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and you wouldn't really know that by looking at them, at least you know, just looking at the customizations themselves yeah. as to whether they're still in use. So in, in that uh, sort of aspect, th there are a few good tools as well. I mean, you have the uh, the attribute uh, usage inspector. I, I don't know the exact name of it, but I mean, that can at least help you to see, okay, we have 250 custom attributes on the account entity because some mad consultant was there. Uh, and is it being used at all? And then you can uh, get a sort of assessment mm -hmm. of, okay, where is the information actually stored that the customer is using? Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a really good tool to use just to, to sort of get a picture of what, what's really happening in their system today. Well, how are they using it and why? Yeah, and, so I, did, uh, I did get that one to run on the account entity. And yeah. like you said, I, I found 140 custom attributes on the account entity. 118 Ooh. of them have got no description. Um, and about the same number are never used. Right? There's no data in any of those fields on any records. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble I ran into was with contacts who had about 60 custom fields and incidents, which didn't have that many, but there's 3 million incidents in the system and over nearly 2 million contacts. So it, it, the tool was just timing out. It couldn't read that many records. Yeah. So, um, yeah, bumped into a little bit of a barrier. You should have a chat with Tengi about that. So we... Fix the performance there, but help. <laughs> if I can continue, I think I mean the next step would be a tool which is actually in the platform. I'm not sure how useful it is though, since there are quite old versions. But 
Probably not at all, but <laughs> well, if you migrate it to a modern environment, I, w- I would want to look at the solution layering. I mean, uh, assuming the customer knows what he's doing and has uh, a sort of a thought through uh, structure of managed solutions and seeing the layering between those uh, to, to get a grip of, okay, are there any base solutions here? Is there any core functionality for the client? Do they have separate branches? I know maybe they are ge- geographically distributed or different silos in the business. Do they have a customer service, a customization solution, and what's on top of that and so on? So looking at the solution layering when you're properly working with managed solutions would really help you in this case. Are you hearing me, Neil? If you are using managed solutions, you will get a lot of help of this. You lost me at managed solutions. There are, <laughs> there are about hey, Daryl, or... have you seen Neil? I think he went for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> there are 40 or 50 unmanaged solutions. There are, there are no managed solutions. So, which which means there's one uncustomized layer. That's, yeah, that's, that's all right. you have. Okay. Yeah. So there's 40 or 50 unmanaged solutions, and they're you know usefully named Hotfix 45, Hotfix 46. <laughs> yeah. um, and a few of them, account ribbon, contact yeah. ribbon. And there's there's no there's no description and uh, okay. you know it's very hard to find it. Well, you can open up the the solution, find out what was in it. But I always think of unmanaged solutions like a like a paper bag. They just get emptied into the unmanaged layer, and then you can throw yeah, it like these compostable paper bags that just <laughs> sort of disintegrate, and you're stuck with the rest is still there. Yeah, all the trash. Yep. Okay, so no, Works on no. That <laughs> exactly. Well, something obvious we haven't mentioned is, uh, of course, a metadata document generator. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, it's must. I it's been a while since I used it, but I guess you can also there. Well, now solutions is nothing to trust, obviously, in this environment. But you can select to only include things in the solution and export that. So then you can at least send it to someone who likes to read Word documents. Right. So that will give me a list of all the well, all attributes, I guess, custom and system. And fields and views and um, forms and everything else as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And so that's one of the things that Snapshot does really well. Produces actually produces an Excel spreadsheet with various worksheets along the bottom. So one for all the entities, one for all the attributes, one for all the forms, views, and and so on. Yeah, does that really nicely. Then you can just filter by: is it customizable? Is it um, searchable? All those kind of attributes. So the first part was just kind of figure out what the system is. And the second part that usually why they're asking you to figure out what it is, is to say what's involved to go to online. A simple tool, just like Visual Studio Code, once you've downloaded those web resources and just search for XRM dot, uh, we'll, we'll get about 85% of the issues where you'll, uh, you'll get false positives there as well. But that will at least give you an idea of how many times are they accessing stuff that's going to need to be touched and changed and manipulated. So, um, so that's like a, a another, uh, I don't know, I guess it's a tool, but yeah, another thing to think about to try to help to give a number and an estimate of what's going to be involved to uh, getting this to work. Uh, if you are going to migrate over the JavaScript as is from hmm. one environment to the next. I didn't know that. So every bit of JavaScript that references XRM dot is, is that method's been deprecated. So that all has to be updated. Not exactly. Um, Most of it though. Like, okay. There's still other stuff that's still global. XRM dot still works, um, but then, but 85, 90 percent of the time that you ever you use that on the client side, you're going to be using the the stuff that's no longer global. Right. So, uh, so yeah, without having to spend any time looking into it, oh, I'm, we're using it a hundred times. All right, not too bad. We're using it five thousand times. This is going to be bad. Um, right. So, so yeah. Just a, so my my current bit. thinking is for for every feature that we find. So I know, for example, there's a custom. Is feature a political feature. way of saying every bug we find a crappy thing? No, or? no, every, <laughs> no. I mean every usable, for every feature in, in, for every uh, area of improvement. <laughs> so there's a end user feature called client search, and it's kind of a structured search. You can put in the first name, the last name, date of birth, and find clients who meet those criteria. Okay. Um, that was developed as a kind of a uh, web resource. It's an MVC kind of structure. We would propose something different for that, maybe a, a PCF component. So we're taking, you know, this is what you've got today. This is what it looks like. This is how we would reproduce that feature in a more modern environment. So that's kind of the level that we're going to go to in the, in the migration to online roadmap. So I just need to figure out what that feature is, how it's built, what components it's got underneath, um, so I can kind of describe it. Yeah. 
Um, a tool for a that. feature, it, right, Daryl? It's this one up here. It's in your brain. Yeah. <laughs> in years of experience. I got another one as well. I mean, if we're, as Daryl mentions, what is being deprecated? What won't work in the future for the solutions? Uh, and that's the Power App Checker or the Power Platform Checker. I, I'm not sure what it's called nowadays, but it was it, it's Solution Checker or Power App Checker and so on. And you can even, you cannot use that outside i mean you have to have an online environment to use that tool if you are uh, using the the maker portal or any, any any microsoft provided experiences but but the power app checker also exposes an uh, an api you can work with so there's a tool for that in xm toolbox as well so there's the power app checker for xm toolbox and in this one you don't have to connect to an online environment you can connect to an on-premise environment or you can just uh, point out to your local solution file and then you can run the power app checker with the rules you select or a specific rule set and it will run it of course with i mean the today's version of uh, of all the validations being done but it, you can you can do it on a, any solution and i of course, it, uh, if you try to upload a Serum 2011 solution, it will probably say, I, I don't recognize this, it's too old. But, but I think definitely think you can do that on the solutions you have and just export it from the, from the environment and run the solution checker. And you will get a lot of tips and hints on uh, deprecated JavaScript stuff or plugins not uh, do, doing things that are not performant and so on. So that would probably give you a good idea of what you need to fix. It, it's not really for documenting the system as it is, but yeah. what you need to fix before going online. I'm yeah. I'm unsure yet whether we're going to migrate, you know, other than the data, whether mm -hmm. we're going to migrate any of the customizations at this point. All right. I'm thinking they're so old, we'll just rebuild whatever features that they use today that they need to use tomorrow. So we'll redo those. And we'll introduce new features that they're missing today that they really want that they haven't developed in their old system. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about the value of taking seven-year-old customizations. It's just so much has changed <laughs> since then. You know that you wrote a workflow for that because there's no business rules available in those days. Yeah. You, you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, that's good to know. I, how would I how would I take all that custom stuff in the unmanaged layer and all the customized system components and package those up into a new unmanaged solution package. So, so to find w what did we touch? Yes. Yeah. Finding what, what is really, what is, yeah, well, basically that is all the un unmanaged customizations, everything on top of the the base base solution. I, I don't know what it was back in 2013, but there, there was probably some core solution for the sales and customer service and everything. Um, I'm not sure. I I know there's been a lot of talk, and uh, everyone wants this. Just g give me all the unmanaged customizations, and I mean you can find it currently in the I mean in the online versions. You can see okay what it, what is unmanaged, and you can remove the unmanaged layer on it. But I th still think it's by component. So getting this overall view and mm. and even saying okay put everything everything unmanaged in a new solution for me that that would be awesome. So any takers out there, just to build the tool, please. <laughs> Neil ne needed it last year. <laughs> no, I think that's where you get some nephew that you don't like, and you teach him how to just add things manually, and you give him a hundred bucks to spend three hours doing it, and, and yeah. everyone wins. But, but you still, you still somehow need to find it. out what is on what what is in the unmanaged layer of the solution or of, of this environment, and to know because it doesn't have to be in any solution. It could be in all the forty of those solutions. You have no idea of how to actually yeah. find what has been customized, especially if they deleted any other solutions. Now they never deleted any. You can just use the solution component mover and move all of the all of the solution items from one solution into one mega solution. That would be if they never deleted. Assuming it, those compostable solution that. bags haven't decomposed yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and also you you never know. I mean, you don't know if your customizations are even in a solution and the other way around in a in an unmanaged solution you have no idea if this component included in it has even been customized true so it's it's it's, it's tricky both ways there but I, also i mean an obvious thing when you're documenting if you go back to to that part of it is to have some sort of to, to generate the model visually generate the model and i know 
current, I know four tools to, that, to do that. There's one from Microsoft. Uh, you run it some command line with like two and a half kilometers of parameters and telling you what to include and so on and how to generate it. Never used that it. The old, I, that's the old Visio tool that was in the SDK years ago? Yeah, I, I think it's still, I've seen it in the documentation oh. recently. But okay. uh, as I said, I I've, that was still good. I've, I've seen the docs and I was like, nah. So, and after that, the, the nah. yeah, nah. the first one I saw was Swedish for no. It could be, yeah. <laughs> it's more Danish. <laughs> nah. Uh, nah. Uh, All right. uh, but the first one for XM Toolbox that I know of is uh, from uh, Bas uh, van Sande. Uh, I think it's Dutch, who created the entity relation diagram generator or something like that a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't think it's been touched for a couple of years. And uh, it generates a model within the tool that you see visually in the tool. You can select from a solution or from an entity and, make and decide how many sort of levels of relationships you want to include and so on. And you can um, work with it um, graphically in the external toolbox tool. Next one is something I created, UML diagram generator that uh, I, I didn't work with all the graphic stuff. So it creates a text file, which is uh, plant UML, some sort of open source standard where you can just add a uh, an extension it's to... vegan. <laughs> Sorry. It's vegan. It's, ve it's plant UML. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Plant. Uh, <laughs> you can just... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just <laughs> going to continue talking here. Sorry. Yes. Thanks, Janice. <laughs> So you add an extension to VS Code or you use online tools to get this text plant UML file to generate as a, as a model. But then uh, quite recently, Carl Cookson Cookie created one that actually generates Visio files for you. Uh, and there, there are a few different ways of how to select what to include in it. But there, as I see it, there are three different options that you can use currently in XM Toolbox to generate a model. And... I, at least for me, that's where I would start I, to, to get a picture of what the what the solution looks like, what what kind of data they're working with. I would use one of those tools to see the picture. I need to see the picture. I need to see the boxes and the the yeah. sort of lines between them, and and to see how what are the relationships like. So to, just just to get a feeling for the system. Yeah, so that, that's where we started. Actually, one of the guys in my team generated a entity relationship diagram in used to be called draw.io. It's now called diagrams.net. Um, it's got some pretty good um, entity relationship diagramming tools, but I have a funny feeling he didn't start with a Visio import, which so you can import from a Visio file into this thing. I think he did it by hand. Right? Hmm. He just navigated his way around the data model, yeah. um, which obviously took him a long time compared <laughs> to using a tool, but the benefit was he was able to eliminate entities that weren't being used or, you know, because um, I imagine those... Um, diagramming tools will show up a lot of entities that have relationships to the stuff that is being used, but you know, yeah. it doesn't look at the kind mm -hmm. of records, for example. Mm -hmm. So you'll see stuff even if there's zero num zero records. Yeah. And as soon as you include the task entity and tell it to, yeah, include related entities, then you have 240 entities on your map. Yeah. Because <laughs> everything can have a task. I got another one that would be for the more technical aspect of it. Um, and I've never walked into a client where this was the case, although I've left the client when it was the case, but I've never walked into the client where it's the case where they actually have unit tests that they've actually ran and are valid because those are the absolute best documentation you can get. Because if they pass and they're fat and they pass and they're like legit tests, they are going to tell you what it does and it's going to be recent and it's going to be valid because the, pass, the test passed. So you know that it works. And so that is, that's gold. Um, but I've never walked into a client where they had unit tests. Yeah, but it, it, it's gold. It's gold when the tests test everything. But I mean, I, I think to me the issue is you as a develop. It's gold for anything they test. How about yeah, that? Ex exactly, exactly. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of you set it up to test this code that I just wrote, and I know how it should work. I I can think of three different scenarios when it shouldn't work, so I make sure the tests handle that. But then if I forget, or if I don't think about the other 15 cases, then there are no tests for mm -hmm. that. And the, those four tests mm -hmm. I did create doesn't really tell me anything other than, well, this narrow happy path or this very narrow unhappy path 
works as expected, but all the other paths are not tested. So yeah, uh, I'm not entirely with you there. I'll take a little bit that I can trust than a lot that I can't trust. <laughs> yeah. So Darryl, and if it's in a Word document or an Excel document, yeah. I can't trust. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna forgive my ignorance here, but those unit tests, those just for the for the business logic that's wrapped up or encapsulated in, in a plugin. Mm-hmm. Do you, do developers write unit tests for their JavaScript, and would I see that in the web resource files? Presumably not. They can. Um, you would not see them in the web resource files. It would have to be in the source control. Right. Um, but that is done less often than even the plugin tests. Right. Uh, not that it can't be. I, I've done it myself, and I've seen other people do it. But um, yeah, that's so yes. So that is another uh, potential area with it. But even with that, you can look at the test, and if they're written well, and you say, you know, when this happens, do this. When this happens, this should happen. And you can not even look at the test; just look at the names and get something. Mm-hmm. Get something. It may not be great, but it, it's something, and it was pretty much free because you just read some some files. So when you say testing JavaScript, uh, unit tests for those, it can be done, but not really. You, what you mean is it's only Scott Duro who does it. <laughs> no, I, I have other people that have done okay. it. Um, but it's just not done as often because I guess in our space, not as many pe- people tend to come from the C-sharp background rather than the JavaScript mm-hmm. background. That's and fair. so they're not as comfortable with some of the tools in the JavaScript. So, so would you uh, say it's, it's being not as easy to set up? Would you say it's being more used when you're working with TypeScript instead then? I would say yes, because that's what I use it for. Yep. But um, there, there's no reason that it has to be. Mm. Um, the tools that I used for doing the testing were JavaScript testing tools, not TypeScript testing okay. tools. Um, but yeah. Mm. All right. I'll look out for any unit tests we can get our hands on. I have a funny feeling there's nothing. And like you said, Daryl, you don't often walk into a situation which has got good <laughs> unit test coverage. Um, talking about um, security configuration, you know, everything from business units, security roles, field level security. What's what's out there that I can use to analyze the security setup and figure out what's been constructed there? Anything that comes to mind? That's a good question. I, I think now I'm on thin ice here, but I think there are there is a tool or three in the external toolbox that where you can sort of get a report of the security. So you say you can say for include these uh, security roles and just tell me give give me a report of those. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that there is one, but uh, there should be, right? Okay, I'll do it and, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I think I've seen something about it. So that would definitely help. I mean, you don't want to open each security role and check all the all the pies, pies and green green dots there and so on. Can I ask you? Uh, maybe uh, we'll move away from documenting the current system. Um, as an architect designing uh, a new system, one of the things we have to deal with is different types of customer. Um, in this industry, we're talking about individual investors, but we also have financial advisors and uh, government stakeholders and other people involved in, in the investment industry. I would like to have just a contact record and the contact record can have a type, but I don't want to have a single option set that says this contact is an investor because you can be of multiple types. And I'm wondering from a design perspective, I've got my own preferences about how to handle those scenarios. And I see them in almost every... Check boxes, every check boxes, check boxes <laughs> everywhere. Isn't that what a multi-select option set's for? What's problem solved? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm wondering how you normally handle those scenarios. You must have, you know, Whatever type of entity it is, you need various types. Mm-hmm. And do you create sub entities? You know, do you have a contact record and then an investor record underneath that, or can you handle it in a smarter way? Can, can I give the MVP answer? Sure. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on on the amount of types. It depends on the volatility of them, if that's what you say. I mean, how much are much are these changing and so on? So. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we need to be able to see these in different languages? That's one thing. If you do, you have to use option set. You cannot use data like lookups. So, well, there there's a lot of things affecting this. The, or should some be restricted? Only certain uh, users should be able to select some of these types. Is there other data you want to record that you wouldn't want on the other types and that kind of stuff as well? Those all kind yeah. of go into that decision. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know where... 
CDS is headed, but I think there's a couple of limitations in the data modeling capabilities of the platform. I think this is one of them. The other one that I keep bumping into that really frustrates me is the limitation that accounts and contacts have a one-to-many relationship. You know, it's designed that a contact works for an employer and uh, therefore you have one account lookup on the contact record. But if you're a part-time worker and you've got two jobs, that doesn't really work. I was actually in a discussion around just this today with a colleague of mine because they have this scenario that, well, exactly this one. You have the social security number or whatever, which is the identifier, and then you want them to be able to act in a B2C scenario, and then you want them, perhaps they are working at a company, so it's a B2B scenario as well for this client where we're installing this. And well, no problem. We can use the contacts have the, the parent customer ID, which is, I mean, even the label is company name on the form by default, but that can lo- can point to other contacts as well. So, okay, maybe we have the like the parent contact always ha- is the one with the identifier, the social security number, and then you are well. It, it's actually within the name of the entity. It isn't person. It is contact. So you have this is a method of contact for you, me as a private person, or this is a method of contact for me working at Contoso. So yeah, that works. So we can have like the 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 different contact methods have parent customer ID is the person that I am as well. Yeah, but then there's only one parent customer ID, so it cannot point to both me as sort of the social security number ID and to the account where I'm working. So it's like ah, there, this has been a struggle forever. Yeah. That's just so why can't you just create your own custom relationship? I can, but there. W- I think there would also be a lot to gain from using the the out of the box uh, relationships where you have the roll up uh, behavior as well. Yeah. So you, if you you can see all the communication from the sort of the, the top mm-hmm. the person record, not only from the contact records. Yep. Um, okay. Well, it's good to know. I'm not the only one that's running into those. No, 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 no. I I, I told you reasons. I told you my side of it and our discussion today. I want you to give the solution now. Well, I, um, I like your your idea of having a person record. I've I've um, described the contact record to my customers in the past as think of it like a business card. It's the combination of a person and where they work. And mm-hmm. if that person leaves that company, you'd maybe throw away their business card. You would do the same with the contact record. You would yeah. deactivate it, create a new one if they give you a new business card because they started work at a new company. But you you might want to persist some data about the person, like you said, their yeah. their first and last name, their date of birth, their social security number, and in a in a new object called a person record that uh, is parental to contact records. Yeah. Um, that's a, a decent design. The other one I'm thinking of is treating the contact record as the person and then having a new intersect entity between accounts and contacts called, yeah. uh, I don't know, employment position. Role or something. Yeah, uh, I think that's yeah. the, the the most common scenario I've seen at uh, least. Yeah, and I store their work phone number and I store their work email address on that um, entity and their job title and so on. The trouble is marketing tools, for example, yeah. normally want you to work with contacts, not with roles. So yeah. you're stuck. And, and even incoming email, it won't, it won't be tracked right. to, to that entity. And yeah. so. yep. You're partially stuck. You're mostly stuck. You can, <laughs> yep. you can still write a retrieve plugin that does some magic and, and starts retrieving those things as contacts. So your right. data is not duplicated, but when they go to retrieve it, they can see it. But yeah, yeah. that's still ugly. But I've done it before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah microsoft if you're listening give us some new data modeling capabilities please it's long yeah just you, just recognize acknowledge that we are people as well we are not just methods of contact to someone we can sell something to right yeah yeah i even we can even run into that if you have like families as the account right if you like the family unit as the account well, well what if there's a divorce what if it's a right. stepchild that's in you know more than one family i mean you got to deal with that that way too. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Well, that's that. I didn't find a, a solution to that one, but it's great to chat through some of those <laughs> challenges with yeah. uh, some of the brightest people I know. Thank you very much, um, guys. That's been really helpful. I've got some really good ideas for what I should have done in this technical assessment. Some of the tools and the capabilities that are in the XRM toolbox and and elsewhere. So, I really appreciate it. I I need to sort of get something more in here as well. I don't really know of the of any tool to handle this, but I, I think I mean when you when you approach a solution you've never seen, 
uh, and you want to find out. And Daryl started here with what kind of plugins do we have and so on. But I think something really challenging is you can look at the code, you can look at the customizations, but I want to look at both things. So I want to see, okay, there is JavaScript here. But I mean, unless the methods are called contact on change first name, you are not entirely sure when this is invoked, if it's even invoked at all. I mean, it could be a remnant from whenever. And that in combination with what kind of business rules do we have? What kind of workflows do we have? So sort of getting that web together, I I still struggle. I mean, there there is no straightforward way of finding, ah, okay, so when you change that field, then something kicks in, which fires a workflow. And so sort of getting that. And I don't even know how to, even if I manually sit and look it through and try to trace everything that's happening, I haven't found a good way of documenting that. Mm. How do you document a, a chain of plugins firing and triggering each other and, and so on? The, Anyone, please. I know, as we mentioned, Carl Cookson, he created this uh, recent, very recently released a flow to Visio um, tool. So you can sort of document your flows. Uh, I want something similar, I think, for for plugins and other kinds of uh, business logic, but sort of to find all the paths that this message execution can take, uh, that would be interesting to see. I mean, we've all so, got stuck somewhere at where where it gets circular or triggering, or it triggers fifty three times instead of two because you yeah. never thought it, and you don't see it when you deploy it because of the data volumes are probably not that high. But as the sort of usage of the system grows, you realize these are real performance hogs because the same thing is being done forty three times when it only needs to be done once. Yeah, yeah. So no, that's too. where the yeah, that the server tra- trigger explorer could become helpful, at least if it's online from David mm-hmm. Act, the CDS tools, because at least that will show yeah, you, right. based on this event, here's everything that fires, the work, these workflows fire, these business rules fire, these plugins fire. And so at least that gets you something. Take a screenshot of that at the very least. But uh, that's, yeah. yeah. Well, that's been a really useful conversation, guys. One of the things I wanted to ask you, which you probably don't have time for today, is we, we've talked about the terrible scenario of walking into an undocumented environment. But as... You, know, you mean normal scenario? Normal <laughs> scenario, yeah, the everyday scenario, the absolute majority scenario. What about those occasions when you want to be a, a responsible professional, you know, imagine the next guy coming after me, it's an axe murderer scenario where I should be documenting the system as I develop it. I, I'd love to chat through with you, maybe on another day, what are the best practices, um, particularly in my case, we're working with agile teams to continuously document the systems as we go along. What tools should we be using? What best practices are out there? That would be an awesome conversation as well. Daryl, maybe you can find another co-host for that episode. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my answer is unit tests, but that uh, that doesn't help a lot on the other other side of things. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, That's 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 the hard stuff. That's why bringing people like you, Neil, do that for me. All right. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And and the interns. And write interns. this down. Just, yeah, look at this code, write it down in plain English or Swedish. Guys, thank you very much. Have a great day. I'll catch you next time. Yeah. Good talking to you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks to Daryl and Jonas for sharing their expertise. I feel like I've just had a documentation tools masterclass with two experts in their field. I hope you learned as much from their advice as I did. A quick reminder, you'll find show notes, transcription, links to all those tools, and contact details for Daryl and Jonas and their podcast at customary.com slash 023. I've got an amazing guest joining me on the next episode of The Amazing Apps Show. My episodes on estimating business applications have been amongst my most downloaded, and if you enjoyed those episodes, you won't want to miss my special guest coming up next time. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. I'll see you there. Keep sprinting.